Hello, everyone. The day is Thursday, December 5th, 2019. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending once again this week. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I am humbled by your presence. All right, what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I think we're still in a bull leg so far. We finally got a little bit of a pullback, but it wasn't really enough to produce a plethora of setups, although it did produce one or two that were worthwhile. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them on the stocks, on the slides, that is, until we get to the live charts, and then you can ask about whatever you want. Also, your favorite stock picks, hold off on those too, and this is both for your benefit. Hold off on those until we get to the live charts. That way, I won't, um, they won't get missed. And then also ask about one at a time, again, for your benefit, so I can delete each one after we talk about it, make sure I talk about all of them. So what can we talk about? Well, the only two things that you need to become a successful trader. I woke up this morning thinking, well, you only need one thing. And then it's like, well, there's another thing that goes with that thing. Before we get into that, there's a player screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Always, I like to sum it up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then, barring a line from my buddy, Greg Morris, who should be visiting here in about a month or two. Looking forward to seeing him. We'll try to get him on camera. I don't think he wants to be on camera, though. He's kind of he's kind of retired, although he's making some rumblings about getting back into the business. All right, so here are the only two things that you'll need to be successful. Patience, as I mentioned earlier, and a little thing called discipline. And I think patience and discipline go hand in hand. So you need the patience and discipline to wait for setups. Stockcharts.com asked me to do a little end of year wrap up and a little bit of that material has found its way into this presentation. And I was certainly inspired quite a bit. I finished it up probably about oh, nine or 10 o'clock last night, long day yesterday getting all this stuff out. But anyway, they asked me to talk about what lessons I learned in, in 2019 and how the markets changed in 2019. And I was like, you know, I really don't have anything to say because nothing's changed. And uh, basically, I, I did the same thing that I did in 2018 and 17, 16, 15, going all the way back 20 years. And then I got to thinking about it. It's like, well, it would probably be important to tell everyone to be consistent, to be patient, to have discipline. Because in 2019, we had a lot of choppy sideways conditions, even though, you know, the buy and hold people are going to look at the beginning of the year, the end of the year and say, oh, we're up 25 percent, you know, huge year. Well, there was a lot of zigs and zags in between, and you would be a fool, I think, to hold through most of those, specifically in individual issues. Now, if you're long a long-term market timing system, such as the TFM 10% system since March or whatever, and you're hanging on, that's fine. But as far as the trading aspects, when you're seeing a plethora of shorts, I think you should short. As I said in the video I made, shorting is not just because it's the only way to make money when the market goes down, but more importantly, it helps you to see both sides of the market. And as I've said, a nausea, my friends who run hundreds of millions of dollars, they always kind of see the glass as half full versus half empty when the market gets a little iffy. And usually, especially if the market is trending higher longer term, usually they are right. But it does help you to see both sides of the market. But before I digress too far, on November 13th, if you looked at my service, there was nothing to do. I couldn't find any setups that I thought were worth trading. So I recommended doing nothing. Years ago, it's interesting, years ago when I was with trading markets, they actually had a sales staff. I'm just pretty much me here now. But the salesman would call and literally beg me to recommend something, just anything, because they didn't really lose clients when I was losing money with crappy setups. They lose a few, but for the most part, they were able to hang on. But where they lost money was when I didn't recommend doing anything for a while and people got bored and they weren't willing to be patient. They were just simply looking for action. So I could have recommended a bunch of crappy setups and made a lot more money in the educational business. But what's her name from um, Game of Thrones? Aria? 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 
That's just, that's not me. Anyway, so 13th, no setups. And then on the 14th, no setups. On the 15th, no setups. On the 18th, it was a weekend in between, no setups. On the 19th, no setups. On the 20th, no setups. On the 21st, no setups. And you're probably thinking, why in the hell am I paying this guy to tell me to do nothing? Well, let me tell you something. I really wish years ago that I had a guy that would tell me to do nothing. And kind of scratching my own itch here. I'm sort of doing what I wish I had 20 something years ago with this trading service. Somebody that's gonna work hard and tell me when I don't need to do anything and be a little tough love here and there saying, well, honor your stops, here's your entry. Don't enter unless it triggers and so on and so forth. So anyway, we go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Can't find a setup to save my life. Usually this is about the time people quit the service, either actually quit the service or just give up for a while. Like, ah, I'm gonna go on vacation for a while. I'm not even gonna look at the service. And usually when they get back, they're unpleasantly surprised. So what happened? Friday, 22, the Friday before Thanksgiving week, November 22nd, we get a setup. So what happens? Well. You needed the patience and the discipline to wait for triggers. So we waited and waited and waited and waited and waited, and then we got a setup. Well, what happened? Did it trigger? No. We had to wait and wait and wait. So here's a setup on Friday, November 22nd, 2019, KOD. And there's the parameters, kind of a volatile stock, as we now know, <laughs> for sure. Seven points, seems like a lot, but that's what it called for. So there's the setup. And there's your little TKO, there's your entry. What happens? Monday, no trigger. Tuesday, no trigger. Wednesday, no trigger. Thursday, Thanksgiving. Kind of sound like Godfather, huh? Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday. What happens on Friday? Well, Friday's a shortened session. Why even bother trading, right? Well, the market can be a little perverse. As a general statement, it's not a good idea to trade on the day before, or day after, I should say, Thanksgiving, or the day before Christmas, around those holidays. But every now and then, something sets up, and you have to follow the system. So it triggers somewhat late in the day. And I actually, and this a lot of this presentation is going to be on being disciplined, obviously, but I actually have to force myself, and I have a list of things to do, sort of a checklist, and that's part of my mission statement is, okay, check the service setups, check any setups that I might be taking that are a little bit out of the set, our service, check to see if I have any initial profit targets or take it, kind of take care of my own house first, make sure there's no new setups that, that are going in as trend trades, make sure there's no stops that need to be placed, make sure there's no initial protect, I'm sorry, initial profit targets that have to be placed with limits on more spiky stocks or volatile stocks or stocks that are low in volume and so on and so forth before looking for something like an opening gap reversal. So anyway, discipline requires a lot of discipline. So what happens? You wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, nothing happens. And finally on Friday, it triggers. I got a lot of emails from people. A few of them thanked me. But quite a few said, no, Dave, I was out of town. I didn't even bother looking. I just took the day off because it's going to be thin and choppy. Or, you know, I looked at it earlier in the day and it just didn't look like it was going to trigger. So I just didn't bother. And I don't want to pour salt in anyone's wounds because I've missed some big trades before too. Big trades that I've even recommended to other people. So it happens, spelled the silent S-H. But the bottom line is you have to be disciplined and you have to put some commitment devices into place, and I'm going to touch upon that later on. Now, this does not mean you can't have a life. I travel the world, speaking the good word of technical analysis, but I do carry a laptop with me. And in more recent years, I've been able to, thanks to VPNs and such, I've been able to place trades on planes and place trades through a cell phone, et cetera. So you can still have a life. You don't have to watch a screen all day. In fact, I recommend you don't. It only takes a few minutes or even a few seconds really to place your orders. And the best thing you could do is just have all these orders queued up 
And this is what I do every morning. I come in and if the same order for yesterday needs to go in today, then I place that order. And all I do is just resubmit it. And it's pretty easy to do. It only takes a few minutes max. And then you can go about your life. So anyway, what I'm getting at is this one turned into the mother of all trades overnight. Now, again, though, it required the utmost discipline. And unfortunately, a few of you guys missed it. But next time, we're going to be ready. And next time, we're going to all be there, right? By the way, I didn't really want to get into this, but the Facebook group has been a godsend. My wife is like, man, your mood is so much better since you started that Facebook group. Your trading has been so much better. You're just generally happier. You're not depressed. <laughs> You're just uh, pretty much a, a good uh, in a good mood and happier. Now, I know last week really helped. But in general, I want to thank you guys for participating, and I appreciate that. You have to be a gold member. No, you have to be a gold member to be into the Facebook group. And that's just to keep the riffraff out. Well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of half kidding. But if you've been in these forums before, man, if they're not heavily moderated, it's it's horrible. It's uh, spam and junk and people day trading 150 times a day chasing their own tail. It'll all drive you crazy. So here's another one, truth be told, I nearly missed by not following my own rules. And I was here. That's what pisses me off. I'm still mad at myself for this, even though I caught it. But I'm still mad at myself because I nearly missed it. And what saved my ass was the Facebook group. You guys were talking about it triggering. And I'm like, holy crap, it triggered. I didn't think it was triggered. Why? Well, I came in. It's like, man, the stock looks good. Kind of TKO looking. Bow tie ish first thrush ish bottoming out ish IPO Phoenix type of strategy and a few other good looking things, right? And what happened? Well, we got the buy signal and it didn't trigger, 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 didn't trigger. It was like eight freaking days. I came in all disciplined like Dave Landry is. And place an order, 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 place an order. Eight freaking days in a row. What did I do on a ninth day? Didn't even bother. It was trading lower on the open. Like, this thing is not going to trigger. Screw that. Well, why not just take 10 seconds, maybe even less, because it just would have been a resubmit and resubmit the order. Okay, a minute. Let's say a whole 60 seconds. And I bet I could do it in 10 seconds, but 60 seconds. Why would I not do that? Well, I figured why bother? It's, it's what's amazing to me is, and I'm trying to beat myself up a little bit here. Doing a good job, I think. But what's amazing to me is the amount of time, the mental masturbation, thinking, eh, I'm not going to bother. Why bother? And there's no need to bother. Well, I could have put the order in in that amount of time. So you have to have a checklist. You have to have these so-called commitment devices, which, again, I'll touch upon in just a few minutes. You have to have the discipline. And the market is really perverse. And one of the problems with the methodology, and as I've said a thousand times, if I ever saw for it, you'd never see my fat ass again, is this outlier characteristic. You have to chip away at it, chip away at, at it, chip it away at it, chip away at it. And as a trend follower, you're going to spend the majority of your time underwater, meaning giving up open profits or worse, in a bona fide drawdown. Now, the way I try to solve for these things and mitigate these things is to take the swing trade and make sure the position has the potential to make a little pop so we can get our quick little money out and then stick around with the remainder of the position, free rolling, as Charlie Kirk calls it when he was looking at my money management to hopefully, I don't know, I just said hope, but hopefully ride out a longer term trend. And as I've said before, a lot of psychology in all of that, a lot of that Maslow's climbing that hierarchy of needs, which was it, how does it work? It's like Wi-Fi and then food, shelter, air, all the things that you need. So anyway, this one took off 60% in one day. Unfortunately, it did come back in, but we were able to take partial profits for better than a poke in the eye trade. If you could do this on every trade, you don't in the world, obviously. Now, here's the biggie, and I beat the dead horse on this 
over and over again. But you really need the patience and the discipline to wait in positions. And I see it all the time because I deal with a lot of you people, okay? And you people, is this stock ever going to move? Somebody just yesterday in the Facebook group, not going to throw you out, not going to throw you under the bus, Kuyong. But uh, <laughs> but you're you're losing patience. And I understand, and it's hard. And I'm going to touch upon why that's hard in just one second. But you really need the patience to wait in positions. Take a look at AUI. This is a stock that Kuyong was talking about. Nice little TKO pattern, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. What happens? And also, by the way, that stock was accelerating higher. We get a buy set up, got our stop down here. What? He immediately begins to take off a little bit. We're feeling pretty good. Got our initial profit target ready to go at 420. And what happens? It's all over the place, trading sideways, sideways. But Dave, why not get out? No, because we are going to follow the plan. And the more we follow the plan, the more we build that muscle. And the more we build the muscle, the more reps we get in, the more discipline we become. And then the longer term, the more money we make. So a few days ago, everybody's wondering, geez, Dave, we've been in this thing three and a half months going nowhere well it hasn't stopped out so what the market doesn't always move on our time frame so dead money no let's just sit tight let's see what happens what if you stop out who cares okay i follow the plan and i'm going to reward myself for following the plan even if i stop out that's the hard part to do believe me and trust me i'm not holier than now i'll drop an f-bomb when i stop out but i'm also quick to say next i mean if we go back let's just back one slide up if I were to come in here and see this TKO after an accelerated trend tomorrow, even if this thing fails miserably, I don't care, okay? But if I saw that same setup tomorrow, I would take it. And I think that's when the true enlightenment comes, is when two things happen. One, when you're on the way to enlightenment, you look at a setup after the fact, after you stop out, during your post-mortem, and you say, what the hell was I thinking? and of course, learn something from it, that's great. You're on your way, you're well on your way. If you can figure out why you should not have taken that setup, then again, you're well on your way. But if you look at it and say, that thing looked fantastic, I don't care if I stopped out, I would take that same exact setup again tomorrow. Then you're really getting there. Here's another one, hasn't hit the initial profit target just yet. Nice little TKO. Look at that. That's beautiful. Nice little accelerated trend. Nice little TKO. Took about a week to trigger. It could have got really bored in that time. You could have forgotten to put that order in on that fifth day, right? And again, I'm not holding it now. I've missed some really big trades throughout my career, but I'm working harder and harder and mostly by doing little tiny things to make sure I don't anymore. Stop down here. Initial profit target, 9.58. And it's beginning to wake up a little bit today. I think we're skirting nine bucks a share. Not quite there yet, sorry. Uh, the screen drew me in like a moth. So we're looking for 9.58, one day at a time. Today, looking pretty good. What if it comes in tomorrow? So what, okay? Yeah, I know, I'll drop an F-bomb, but so what? Hold the course, stay the course. And it went sideways for how long? One week, two week, three week, four. And then now it's beginning to take off. No guarantees. You want a guarantee? Buy a toaster, right? No guarantees you can hit that IPT, but it looks like we're on our way. So far, so good. But it required a tremendous amount of patience. Was it dead money? I don't think so. Not anymore. Track supply not too long ago. Sets up late August. What happens? Well, nice little thrust lower, followed by a pullback. Got our parameters all set up. It triggers and then what? Fails miserably for about seven or eight days. You're losing money, okay? And then finally it begins to sell off nicely. And 13 days total later, you're down to the initial profit target. By the way, I don't really consider a position, a lot of people get excited and email me and post and stuff. 
hey, Dave, we're up in, you know, whatever in this position. It's like, oh, settle down, Beavis. I know that makes me butthead, but settle down, Beavis. Let's not get too excited or start kissing each other until and unless we hit that initial profit target. Then we're free rolling, and then we're in a really good position. Now, this thing has kind of crawled back up since for one, two months or whatever. What do we do? Nothing. Stay the course. You get stopped out, you get stopped out. Yes, drop an F-bomb, we have to. Here's another one, PAGS, sell short. There's the parameters. And these are straight from my trading service for what it's worth. Stop up here towards the old highs, because if it gets back toward this, its old highs, then it's no longer a new emerging trend. Initial profit target down here. What does it do? Well, for quite a while, it did absolutely nothing. In fact, you had one day of profitability and about 21 days, if I counted right, where it was underwater. Now, these, these days are trading days. So how many trading days in a month? Roughly 20, okay? So for a month, you're staring at a losing trade. And what's worse is, I know you people, because I am you people, by the way. When I say you people, I'm either as guilty as you or at one point was as guilty as you or at least tempted to be guilty like you. But the more you look at that screen, I guarantee you in those 21 days, you looked at it more than just once at the end of the day, right? So all those negative observations and one positive observation, it takes its toll on you. From a neurology standpoint, a negative observation has two times the impact as a positive one. And that's why gamblers and day traders and sometimes us position traders, okay, and opening gap reversal traders can get into a lot of trouble and over trade and get into a lot of trouble because you end up chasing that high and you're never going to catch that high because a great observation or a great event has a good positive impact but not nearly as much as a negative one and that's just how our brains work and when we get a little further in the presentation i'm going to sneak a little neurology in to all this anyway 28 days to hit the initial profit target so far so good major top has been caught there knock on wood but it took a while and that's the whole point there's the rest of the portfolio if you're curious and if you want to see the portfolio in action, I'll give you a link in a few minutes. I think it's davelander.com slash archives. In fact, I know it is. davelander.com slash archives. And I keep it a few weeks behind. But I think going back a couple of weeks is plenty enough to be able to see what's going on. You can see the portfolio. And that $1,000 at KOD, that number, thank God for me, turned out to be much, 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 much bigger. And I'll walk you through that one. In a minute not that it always works out that way i think i got a little bit lucky but i did apply a little discretion which helped to get me that luck all right so you want patience and you want it now yeah don't we all so how do you do that well as i often preach the this world we live in this microwave society in fact ironically you know it's called the microwave society bought a brand new house spent a whole bunch of money Spent a S ton on appliances. I had no idea how expensive appliances are nowadays, okay? And we spent a fortune on a little microwave, goes into the cabinet, it's beautiful, looks nice, right? This thing works. It takes like a minute instead of 30 seconds to heat up my food. I'm like, can you believe that? I have to wait an extra 15 to 30 seconds. This thing is slow. I'm, I, I just can't believe it, but this is the microwave society we have been trained in and it's only getting worse and without digressing too far and i don't think i have it in front of me so i'll have to find it but um it's probably in the bathroom <laughs> a little tmi right but i'm reading another one of these and i don't know if you call it behavioral science or behavioral finance but for a while i said i'm not going to read anymore because they all sound the same but now I find that even though they sound the same, they are beginning to click a little bit more and more with me. And a lot of it reaffirms the things that I've read before. And this one 
you know, my, my biggest argument is they, they all tend to glom onto and basically rehash the thinking fast and slow, which I would strongly urge you to read. And someday I'm going to try to sit down and read the whole thing again. It's like 600 pages, but it's really, it's really a good read too. I definitely will read that one. But anyway, the new book, if I forget the name of it, I'll have it for you next week and hopefully I'll be done or certainly further into it. But one of the things they keep rehashing over and over again, in addition to Tversky and uh, what is it, Kennerman, who did the Think It's Fast and Slow. But one of the things they keep talking about is that society has moved so fast that evolution cannot keep up. So our brains are still thinking a couple thousand years ago, maybe even 10,000 years ago, all right? They hadn't caught up on an evolutionary scale. That's not that much time. And what's that? What's that law? I forget the name of it, but there's some law in semiconductors like every so many years, the technology doubles or the speed doubles. And anyway, but it's along those lines. So that technology is moving that fast. So we do have a problem with society putting this pressure on us to become less and less patients, to make us really crappy traders. So how do you get that patience? Well, one thing you have to really embrace, and it's something I've learned about, and I probably got it out the Kirk report a year or so ago, but I think he was talking about Acrasia in James Clear book, which is a good book, by the way. It's a, it's on habit. I'm, I'm going to mention another book I suggest you read on habit, although I do have some a little bit of a beef with it, but we'll get to that. Acrasia, as I've stated before, is a state of mind in which someone acts against their better judgment through the weakness of will okay you break your diet and you eat the fries or drink the beer or whatever the case may be you give in to the siren call of day trading you're like a moth to the screen and as i've said before it's kind of like the going back to is it uh was it in ecclesiastes or where where did paul say that or maybe Romans, where he said that he knows he's doing the wrong thing, but he does it anyway. And I actually did a whole article and actually a series of articles and webinars just on that. Somebody sent me this email, sent me a, an email, I should say, and said, hey, I, you know, if you like Paul, and that made it to Traders Magazine and was published in many different countries and many different languages and good stuff, I think, if I say so myself. But all that, and that's before I even knew what a crazy was. And again, it's a state of mind in which someone acts in their better judgment through the weakness of will. Now, will, by the way, can be weakened. And I'm going to explain that in just one second. So James Clear from his book, and I think it was Atomic Habits. In fact, I know it was. Go to www.davelander.com slash books dash two dash read. And if you click on that book, I think I'll make 13 cents. And I appreciate if you do that. It's better than a poke in the eye. Anyway, he says, a crazy state of, state of acting against your better judgment it is when you do one thing, even though you know you should do something else. A crazy is what prevents you from following through on what you set out to do. Now, I'm going to give you a couple little examples of commitment devices as it relate to trading. But you need some sort of commitment device to make sure you do the right thing. And James Clear went on to say that it's not so much about making a good habit easy. It's more about making a bad habit hard. If you think about it, it's actually both. So I'll give you a case in point. Yesterday, I was staring at the screen, watching the KOD, <laughs> and uh, attempted to make additional trades after I'd already made some trades. And my wife's like, Let's go for a walk. I'm like, ah, I'm kind of busy. I got a, I'm on the deadline, and I don't think I'm. I think I got done about nine last night. It's a crazy day, but I knew if I went for a walk, I'd be even later. But I also later getting done. But I also knew that if I didn't go for a walk, I would waste the hour. I would waste walking because it was. I'd get back right before the close. I'd waste that hour anyway, not getting anything done and staring at a stupid screen. So I went for a walk. Okay. And not always, but a lot of times when I walk away from my screens, it is profitable. And that's one of the rewards of 
going out, get a little exercise sometimes, is it gets you away from that screen. It keeps you from doing what you shouldn't do. Now, you have to do what you have to do. You have to get your orders in. You have to get your stops in. You have to get your initial profit targets in when necessary. But other than that, 99% of the time, there's nothing to do. I placed a few orders this morning and there's nothing to do now. That's why I'm giving a webinar. Now, one thing I learned through a book called Atomic Habits is that willpower gets used up. I'm sorry, this is not Atomic Habits. It's the power of habit. What we do, why we do, what we do in life and in business. Dalio from Principles strongly urged the readers of his book to read this book. He thought it was fantastic. Well, if a billionaire who made a billion, especially since he made his billions trading, tells me to read a book, I'm going to read a book, okay? And where I got a little disappointed in it in that, I mean, it's a fantastic book, and I strongly urge you to recommend it, and I'll have to put it in books to read. But he he went into kind of a long-winded, very detailed into these stories, which I think he could have summarized a little bit better to make his point about habits and such. And then he finally got to the, the really good stuff. The book started really good, and then he went to a bunch of stories, which are, the stories were very interesting in and of themselves, but it was a long run for a somewhat short slide. However, towards the end of the book, it started getting really good. He started pulling it all together and what you could do and what you should do. And then it ended, unfortunately. The last couple of pages were like, man, this is great. I'm Now we're getting to the meat. We're really getting to it. And then he has like an afterword, and then he talks about some other things, and there's another 20 or 30 pages. And that's pretty good too. So I think I think this book could be so much better if he took that last section plus everything he's learned since and come out with a new version of this. Put all that stuff in the back in the middle of the book and I think it would be much better. But overall, it's a good book and I know I'm kind of ripping it to shreds, but I'm kind of ripping it to shreds because I liked it and I think it could be much better. In fact, I'm reading a book now I'm about ready to throw against the wall, Victor Niederhofer's book, Practical Speculation. And that one I don't think I'm going to recommend unless there's something earth shattering further in. But I digress. Anyway, and the power of habit, I don't know how to pronounce the name, Duig, Duig, Charles Duig, and I hope, you know, my apologies, Charles, for if I butchered that, was had a conversation, I should say, with Mark Muravin. And, and I hope I got your name right too, Mark. One of the things that he said, because Mark did this. My buddy Mark, he did this experiment with radishes and freshly baked cookies. And there's been a lot of other of these experiments that have been done throughout the years. And one thing he determined is that the longer you are disciplined, the less likely you will be to continue to be disciplined. Now, that's like on a daily basis. So, for instance, he said, willpower isn't just a skill, it's a muscle. Like the muscles in your arms and legs, it gets tired and as it works harder, so there's less power left over for other things. So you kind of get worn down at the end of the day. And he gave an example of, let's say you want to start exercising after work, you want to go for a jog or whatever. Well, you're going to have to save up a little willpower during the day. If you're grinded down all day and you've had all this willpower used up, then you're not going to have enough willpower to exercise. I know that if I'm going to, like, there's been a few days where I've had good intentions and believe it or not, I know you see me like this guy doesn't exercise. Well, I do, but I also eat a lot. <laughs> you can't outmove your mouth. But the point is, I know that if I am going to exercise, I'm going to have to get it done probably in the morning. By the time I wait for afternoon, I start putting it off and more and more things. And then by the end of the day, I just, I'm out of willpower. I have no willpower left to go exercise. So it does get used up, and you have to be cognizant of that fact. And there's a lot of little things you could do and make them habit, little commitment devices, and we'll get to a few of those in one second. But there's a lot of these little commitment devices, like, for instance, and I'm kind of jumping ahead, but I will not allow myself to, you know, I like to eat, as I just said. That's why they call me Big Dave. But I will not allow myself to eat breakfast until I have all of my orders in place. Now, one of our problems is we have a time inconsistency. And we're always like, and I'm guilty too. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to diet next week. Because that you don't think in terms of 
things being finite, there's always time for that. I'm gonna be disciplined with my trades next week. I just feel like firing off this little day trade right now. I'm gonna do it anyway, right? Even though I know I shouldn't, like Paul. A time in inconsistency is where you're looking for an immediate gratification versus a long-term goal. And this trading that we do, especially with this swing to intermediate term trend following, it is a long-term goal type of thing. It's not a way to produce income. By the way, there's no way to produce income in the markets. Write that down. Indeed, what do we sell options? Well, you can sell options and that'll work until it don't. Eventually you'll blow up, okay? What about being reversion? Well, that'll work until it don't too. But before I digress too far, a time inconsistency is that we're looking for that immediate gratification and we forget about the long-term goal. I mean, I'm thinking about doing something very challenging when I'm 60 years old and it'll probably take a year or two of training to get there. And it's like, I need to commit to that. So I'll start working out towards that goal. But if you don't, you know, a lot of times I'm like, eh, you know what? I'm not going to go to gym because I've got other things going on. I'm kind of busy and I'll get to the gym tomorrow or I'm going to work out really hard next week. Now, the immediate gratification does pay off right away. What's the, the old saying? Procrastination. Uh, I wish I can remember how it said, but basically that procrastin procrastination pays off right away and all this other stuff might pay off over time, but that immediate gratification is right there. It's tangible and it can be rewarding, but it does come obviously with a long-term cost. Now, the I tried to explain this before and this is in pretty much every one of those behavioral science books. And that's one thing that I hate again, is that they all start to sound the same after a while, but it does help sometimes to hear things again. So let me try to see if I can get this right. I'm gonna offer you $500 in debt today or $505 tomorrow. Which one would you take? Well, just to save time, most people would take $500 today. And I probably would too, okay? Or what if I offered you $500 a year from now or $505 one year plus one day? Well, most people would opt for the $505. What's an extra day, right? Well, if you look at the math of this, it's the same. It's $5 one extra day. But this is just a part that, this is just a point about a very simple experiment to show that we have this time inconsistency. There's a lot of modern society pressures on us now. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's like, I refuse to answer a text while driving and I try not to answer the phone, but I'm guilty of doing that. So maybe that's just as bad. And I try not to make too many phone calls, but that's probably just as bad too. So I am, I'm not holier than thou, okay? I'm just saying I'm trying to get better with that. But the reason we have these modern society pressures is my wife expects an immediate answer. Well, I might be in traffic. I might be driving. And I should not, and neither should you, obviously, answer that cell phone. But there's a lot of other society pressures out there. And as I've said quite often, and I try not to let these guys get under my skin, but right when I think I'm getting better, <laughs> right when I think I'm getting better, they pull me back in. There's an ad out there right now, which I think this guy should be shot. I know you can't say that. I don't know. Oh, Dave, you can't say that people should get shot. I know. You can't say that nowadays, but he should get shot. <laughs> you know, they show a guy that's all depressed. It's like, oh, depressed because you have a lot of debt. You know, it's like, what? What are they doing? You know, this poor bastard. And basically they're saying that if you sign up for this guru's trading service or whatever hey, don't you have one hey just wait a minute let me get to my point that all your debt's going to go away well what's going to happen is this poor bastard's going to whip out a credit card and get further to debt okay and more depressed and i could all but guarantee you he's not going to make any money in fact all you need to do is do a little google on these guys and you'll find out quite a bit okay all right, I'm off the high horse. Now, like 
was said earlier, your willpower gets used up, your patience gets used up too. And one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is the monetary and mental pressure. The mental pressure, monetary pressure is really bad, but mental pressure I think could even be worse. So what's that? Well, let's take a look at that. Well, you're always gonna have monetary pressure. And I think that's one thing that I woke up a few mornings ago and I wrote that down and that's something to always remember. And that's something that you can wrap your head around. You're always gonna have bills, okay? Something's always gonna break. Your car is going to break. Your microwave is gonna suck and be too slow and you want a faster microwave, okay? So there's always gonna be bills. There's always gonna be things happening. I, you know, I have a, I like money, right? And uh, I think the reason you and I get along so well is you like money too, like they said, and what was that, idiosyncrasy? Mediocrity, mediocrity or idiocrity, whatever that movie was. It was a pretty bad movie, but it had its moments. Anyway, there's always going to be needs for money, and, and I'm I'm fascinated with very successful people. I want to learn from them. I want to learn, you know, whenever my wife says, tells me about somebody she met through a business or whatever that was very wealthy, I'm like, how did he make his money? How does she make her money? What does she do? You know, what can I learn from them? And the other thing I like, which would having money would help, is I like to sail off, sail off in the sunset one day, of course, Better make sure I have a good satellite computer there because I'm, I'm not sure I could walk away from trading. But anyway, so I do occasionally watch some of these YouTube videos and these people are on these million dollar and half million dollar catamarans sailing around the world. I'm like, how do they make their money? How do they make their money? So I've, one of them was like, how we got enough money to buy a catamaran? I'm like, all right. So I clicked on that, you know, 30 seconds in the video, they said, well, we don't have kids. So I was like, okay, that's all I need to know. <laughs> So you people who have kids, you could agree with me. Just one kid, not just the cost of one kid. I don't know the exact costs or the estimates, whatever, but it's probably about a half a million dollars. And I don't think I'm that far off. Now, I don't want to talk you out of not having kids because they're wonderful. No, they're not. Uh, no, they, they're great. No, they're not. Uh, no, I love my kids sometimes. But just, <laughs> just the cost of one kid could have bought you a very nice boat. But anyway, before I digress too far, I guess the point I'm trying to get to there is that if you have a family, your financial needs are really, really huge. It's amazing how much money you have while you're single. Not that you should not be married and settle down because it's been a wonderful thing for me. I would probably still be an egotistical little shit. Oh, I guess just demonetize my video. Oh, well. <laughs> Had I not had my wife, Marcy, to kind of ground me when I get a little too full of myself and so on and so forth. So it's overall, it's a good thing. I don't want to sound like I'm being negative, but it's expensive and you're going to have a lot of expenses. So you have to embrace and accept that. You can't expect the market to pay for anything. Anytime I really get creamed is when I expect the market to pay for something and I try to force that to happen. And I'm guilty as charged. I talked about that a lot last year with all these stupid appliances I had to build and another $25,000 to move the garage 15 feet back. And, you know, if you've ever built a house, you know, it's ridiculous. And we tried to keep it under control, try being the keyword in that sentence. But what's amazing is not that you don't always need money. And I want to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but when you feel like you're kind of on even keel with everything, it's like, that's when you occasionally hit it out of the park and do incredibly well. And that's when you have to take that little bit from that outlier or whatever and pay off some bills or go out and, and treat yourself to something that you've been wanting. A little, bit, a little bit of reward for your hard work. But you can't expect the market to pay for anything, at least not on your immediate time frame. Livermore said many of people have grown, gone broke trying to pay for a necklace or whatever the case may be. It doesn't work that way. That's not how it works, Beatrice. That's not how any of this works. Now, your mental pressure is something I've been thinking about quite a bit. Can be even worse. And something wrong will occasionally go wrong in your life. And you could look to the markets to try to make up for that. Let's say you have a fight with your spouse or a significant other or both. Well, I, I need to stop making that joke. <laughs> My Russian friend, Dave, I am concerned about you. You talk about your spouse and significant other. 
are you and Marcy okay? It's like, no, 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 we're fine, we're fine. And then as L.R. Thomas and many other people have said, but I'll give her credit, don't expect trading to fill a hole in your life. And by the way, there's always going to be a hole and that hole moves. There's always gonna be some problems in your life that will spill over into your trading. And guess what? Your trading will spill over into your life. All right, let's talk about the two brains. You have the little brain, the primal part of your body, also known as pretty much the lizard brain, okay? And by the way, marketers play upon your lizard brain. I have some books here in my studies of all of this stuff, and I can't say the guy's name because it's about 15 syllables. I don't, I don't know if it's out on display. I think it's one of those books I didn't want to put out on display. My wife was going through my books and she's like, where do you want this one? I'm like, eh, let's put that one out. That's pretty good. And here's one that's that's not so much, but um, I can't think of the name of it. His uh, name starts with a C and it's about 20, 20 letters. And if he writes about manipulation and and things and, and things of that nature. And it's books on persuasion. If you Google persuasion, you should be able to to find uh, his name. And um, my apologies to him. And I'll, I'll get that for you next week. But anyway, that these marketers prey upon that little emotional part of your brain, that so-called lizard brain. And they call it lizard brain. If you look at the, like an alligator brain, it looks a lot like the little thing on the right. And that's your amygdala and all of those little parts of your brain that, and that's all connected to your cerebellum, I think, which clips right on the back of that. And that's for your automated actions or autonomous action, I'm trying to say, in your life. A buddy of mine got punched in the back of the head by a crackhead and he immediately went to the ground, didn't remember it. And he took him a while to recover from it. He's fine now, but he it just messed up that cerebellum where he, he just, he lost his autonomous functions, at least very briefly. Luckily, again, he's okay. But in addition to those autonomous things, that lizard part of your brain, or the lizard brain, I should say, the primal part of your brain, helps to keep you alive. And the more I learn about neurology, neurology is a science. All this psychology is like, oh, God, you know, he's out there, mamby pamby talking about psychology again. And that doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. But it does. And it, it, it's hard to convince people sometimes. And we all have a little bit different psychology, although we all tend to make a lot of the same mistakes. But you can't argue with neurology because neurology is science. Now, some scientists argue amongst themselves, well, the amygdala is your emotions, but there's also another part of your brain connected in here and there, whatever, and blah, blah, blah. But for the most part, it all works the same, okay, on some level with every one of us. So you have the little brain, which keeps you alive, and you're, it's great that you have that, but that hasn't caught up. The rest of the brain hasn't caught up with, with modern day society. The rest of what's sloshing around up there is what makes you, you, conscious thought and these things, what makes us us, right? Now, the lizard brain, makes you do stupid shit <laughs> okay the rest of what's sloshing around up there keeps you do from doing stupid shit so we got to figure out a way to get from that lizard brain over to the rest of what's sloshing around up there so here's a question how long does it take to get from the lizard brain to the rest of what's sloshing around? Well, the answer is two to three seconds, okay? For me, this was a really a, a godsend discovering this because I'm a very emotional being. I'm emotional, egotistical, and I have agreeabilityness, if that's a word, of about 1%, if that much. That's a slight exaggeration, maybe a half a percent. Not a very agreeable guy. I am, if you agree with me. So, as I was saying in the presentation I did last night for stockcharts.com, and as I said in a, a recent article I wrote about affirmations and my mission statement, if you want to make a big change in your trading, and since we're focused on lessons for the end of the year and looking to next year, 
then you need to make a small change. And as I've said quite a bit, almost ad nauseum, this is one of my small changes, and this has saved my ass quite a bit. Because a lot of times I'm looking at a mediocre opportunity because I just need some action because this family thing is very expensive and because I have some wants, I have some needs. I just moved into this new house and there's hidden expenses out the wazoo. And then two nights ago, the dog vomits all over. I don't know how nice it was, but it looked pretty nice to me. It looks like a fairly nice rug, okay? And uh, the wife throws it out, okay? <laughs> it's like, it's like, what's that smell? It's like, did, did she poop the bed? And then my wife's like, what's that smell? Did he poop the bed? And come to find out it was a dog, thank God. Anyway, long story endless, this little card has saved my ass. I, Dave Landry, will take the best, the best, underline the, you to capitalize that. Best ogre, that's open to gap reversal and trend trades, even if this means passing on okay opportunities and watching them occasionally take off without me. How long does that take to read? A few seconds, okay? And that might be enough to bypass that little emotional part of my brain and get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there. So you have to train and trick your brain. I didn't intend, I was trying to get a dog and put a, a brain on his head and this is how it came out, which I think is, is even better. <laughs> I think that the, my neurology kick and my excitement about neurology is that, again, we have this shared psychology that we tend to not all agree on but we have this shared neurology that is constantly working against us. And that sounds like a negative, but that's okay. I think the first step to solving a problem is to recognize it. And in trading, it really works against you. You really are going to have a hard time overcoming that equation, of course, unless you really want to. You're going to be sucked in like a moth unless you turn off your screens. You're going to micromanage unless, of course, you follow your trading plan. And you're going to take mediocre trades unless, of course, you read a little card before every trade and think about it a little. So I would or urge you to make little changes, little changes, little changes, do little things, little things, little things. And, you know, the three-second rule, okay? And Curtis Faith wrote a pretty good book. I'm trying to think of the name of it. The Way of the Turtle was one of his, which was pretty good and enjoyable. I swore I would never read the turtle books. And Larry McMillan told me, oh, it was pretty good. You know, I had a ping pong table when they got bored trading. And I think if my office was big enough, I'd, I'd put a ping pong table in here, as I've said quite a bit. But it's not. Not, not anymore, at least. <laughs> But uh, his other book was Trading from the Gut, I believe, and it should be on the books to read page. In fact, I know it is. And he also talked about left brain, right brain. And once you come up with something left brain, which is your more logical part, send it over to the right brain or vice versa. I'm sorry. Your left brain is more logical right. So if you come up with something from the creative side, your right side, send it over to left to check it out and vice versa. And that's just kind of like thinking through things, allowing that whole brain to work and trying to do that in a relaxed state. Well, that's pretty easy to do when you're doing your trading analysis at the end of the day, because the information is static and not changing. And it's harder to make those decisions in the heat of battle and stress. And by the way, as I've preached before from Steen Barger, which I think I probably found through the Kirk report, he wrote about the fact that it's actually two parts of your brain that are used in trading, one part of the analysis and then one part of the actual trading. And I talked about those two use quite a bit. I've done some presentations on that. So look around my website and look around uh, YouTube. And I think it's called the two use. So keep in mind that three second rule. It only takes three seconds, as I've said quite a bit before. Greg Morris, in order to not crash to not crash planes and simulators, first in simulators and next in real planes, he would wind a clock, metaphorically wind a clock as he got older. I'm sorry, as the planes progressed and no longer had digital clocks. But back in the F4s, he they had a actual clock. And I keep a little airline clock 
on my desk. So you can wind the clock, read the card, do something, create a habit of doing that one little something that takes a few seconds. And that's all it takes, believe it or not. And if you still do something stupid, then well, go have no fun somewhere else. Go do something stupid somewhere else. One thing I've been talking a lot about lately is to time travel taking the trade. If you see a trade and you're getting ready to take it, or if, even if you're doing your analysis, even better, because that way you, you're much more likely to use your whole brain, okay? You're not waking up that little panic monster down in there. But time travel and say, okay, if this thing takes off, that would be obviously a great thing. But what if it what if it doesn't work? What if it turns around and just stops me out? How would I feel? Well, on the trades I just showed you, even the ones that have taken 20 days to work, if I saw them again tomorrow, again, I would take those trades. I think they look pretty good. Your angst, your biggest angst is going to come from those trades that were mediocre when you stop out. You're going to really beat yourself up. And believe me, I beat myself up more than anyone I know, okay? It's just part of my makeup, and I'm willing to embrace that. But again, those mediocre trades, you're going to really beat yourself up on much more than a great trade. And then as I've also beat the dead horse on, turn off your screens. Now, have some little rewards for good behavior. And I'm thinking about it today. I'm thinking maybe of a little bit bigger reward. I'm thinking about going and spending a little money this afternoon as a reward for all this hard work. But a little reward for me, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is that I have to get my orders in before I eat breakfast. Now, I do have a little protein powder early in the morning because my brain needs food. It's the way I operate. I probably have some kind of sugar problem, I'm not diagnosed, but I become hangry very easily. So I know I have to eat a little bit. But I'm getting hungry again right around 9 o'clock Central Time, about a half an hour after the market opens. So before I eat, my new habit that I have created, which is, has a reward cycle in it, and that's something that Duig talks a lot. And again, I hope I'm not butchering his name, but in The Power of Habit, he does talk about that part of the habit where you do have a reward. And if you think about your bad habits, obviously there's a reward in that bad habit, the food, the cigarette, the beer, the alcohol, whatever the case may be, drugs, and so on and so forth. So in this case, it's a positive reward. I like to eat. I need to eat. It's the way my body works, especially now that I work out fairly heavily and I'm biking and all this other stuff. So my body needs food. So I will not, again, eat breakfast or allow myself to eat breakfast until all my orders are in. So that's my little commitment device, my little trick. And come up with your own and make it a game, make it fun. And to me, if I could trick or train my brain, because I know it's working against me, I mean, that's step one. Recognize it's working against you. Step two, do something about that, okay? All right, let's talk about a good problem to have with the KOD trade. So we had a TKO, obviously, and it triggered after oh, almost an entire week of trading, okay, without triggering, as I've just said earlier. Stop is down here, entries here, initial profit target right about there, 36.40 was the initial profit target, okay? Seven point risk, which sounds like a lot, but that's what it called for, okay, because it's volatile. And boy, is it volatile. And it took off the next day. Now, if you look at the spreadsheet, you'll see that, again, the initial private target was about, was exactly, I'm sorry, 36.40, which you'd make $1,000 on a $100,000 account. For every 100000 you should make 1000 if you've adjusted your share size properly, 2% risk. And what I did was I let it open and I saw it kind of blow through fairly quickly that initial profit target. So I just said, well, wait a minute, let me just hold off on my market order here and see what happens. And then I went to get out right around 40 because I said, well, that's that's a pretty good run. I've improved upon that profit target. Then I tried to get out, but it wouldn't take the order. And I was like, well, what's going on? And finally, I realized it was halted. So I pulled my order, waited for it to become unhalted. 
and then it began to take off again. And then I think twice more I put my orders in, and both times it was halted. And then finally it was unhalted. And when it began to come back in, I took profits and I think I ended up getting filled. I think I know I got filled at 55. And then later in the day, probably around 48 or so. Uh, by later in the day, what I did was I sold half at the initial profit target and then I also slow, sold down to the sleeping level, which I thought would be enough. But it wasn't because this thing has huge swings. And so what I did yesterday in this, my, my animation's not right here, but let me just, just bear with me. So when it was trading around $64 a share, somewhere up in there, 63, 64, around noon my time, one o'clock Eastern. If you, in fact, the trade went through right around one o'clock or so. So that's where it is. I decide, you know what, even though these options are somewhat ridiculously priced, if I buy the 55s, I have about three points of fluff to pay for. Fluff meaning extrinsic value. And, you know, in this stock, I think three points was worth it. Now, the options people out there are probably rolling their eyes and, but Dave, that, the, the applied volatility is 120 point percent. It's like, uh, I don't care. Okay. But what I decided to do was flip out of my remaining small position, half of a half, into some options. But I got to thinking, this thing is generally moving in my favor. So what would happen if I put in a five point trailing stop on that so essentially doubled the position up and as i wrote the facebook group this is going to either look spectacular or stupid but i figured it was worth a shot since the market was trending nicely intraday so again the 55 calls roughly 10 points in the money about three points fluff on that seven points intrinsic three points fluff thereabouts a little bit more or less Anyway, so what I did was I did exit on the close. I got out of one position, I think, like two seconds before the close. And then the other position was within the last minute or so of the close. So I flipped out my shares, and now I'm long options. And then I tried to do a little more of this this morning with some call options. Because now I have another problem. It's like now the call options are so far into the money, at least they were yesterday, that now I have a lot of money on the table. So now I have to figure out a way to sell down again to the sleeping level. But anyway, just a couple things. One, discretion. You can apply a little bit. Don't don't go crazy with it, but apply a little bit like, okay, we got the profit target here. It's 36.40. Oh, now it's 36, 37.40, 38, 39. If it keeps going higher, then do one or two things. Just say, okay, well, it's hitting 40 or whatever. That's an extra four or five points. I think that's enough. Let's go ahead and take that profit or maybe trail a stop intraday like I did on this particular position. And then by the end of the day, make sure you're taking those partial profits. So hopefully that makes sense and helps. If you want to see these actual trades in hindsight, foresight in hindsight is what I used to call a delayed service, which I no longer have. It's too much hassle. You just have to go to www.davelander.com slash archives and take a look at those. And if you're on the trading service, down below the service, you can see the recent trading services. And then this URL at the top has been shortened to daylander.com, again, slash archives, daylander.com slash archives. All right. My wife's like, are you promoting your members area? No, not really. So I do have a members area. It's only 47 bucks a month. If you don't have 47 bucks, then you shouldn't be trading. Okay. I'm not going to promise you that you're going to get out of debt and be happy, but I can tell you that the group is a good group and we've got a lot of good traders in there. And I've learned a lot from you guys and it's, it's very collegial. And I, I thank you. I'm not the grand poobah. We all kind of help each other. You've given me a couple of trades, a couple of trades I thought about, but didn't take, or I should say a couple of trades that I thought about, but decided that I wasn't going to take. And then you guys got me to look at them again, like Peloton, for instance, PTON, which was a recent winner. And for that, I thank you. So good group. And then there's a plethora of information. And, you know, this is going to sound stupid, but I can't believe that I'm giving, so to speak, this away for $47 a month. And I'm thinking once we get to maybe, let's say, 100 members, I think I might double that. But we'll we'll figure all that out. But anyway, I promise that I'll make it worth your while, all kidding aside. All right.
And this is the members area. We have Q and A every two to three weeks. And there's four member courses. And then what I'm moving towards is unlocking all of the information for free, even courses that I used to charge quite a bit for over time. So if you want to jump into courses right away, the premium courses that is, you'll have to pay up. But if you're willing to wait a year, you'll get them for free. All right, enough of that soft sell. If you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. Let me shift gears and get the charts up and running. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. And let's start with the P's and then work our way down. Let me go shake my mouse over there. <laughs> but Dave, I told you, I thought you said shake my mouse so my screensaver will wake up. I thought you said not to watch your screen. Well, do as I say, not as I do. But I'm not going to make any trades, I promise. All right, S&P 500 on a micro level, started a little strong today, came in a little bit, no big whoop. We did have this little gap the other day, but I wouldn't get too excited about that. Back to chart out a little bit. And as you can see, we finally broke out above this consolidation, or as we say in Cajun land, consolidation, and had a nice little run higher. We were really due for a pullback, and then we finally got that. I actually would have liked to see a little bit more shakeout move, enough to kind of scare some more people out make them think that, hey, you know what? This is the end of the road, okay? And I haven't studied it lately, but I noticed one of you guys was talking on the Facebook, in the Facebook group, I should say, about the hourly charts. So let's take a look at that real quick since we're here. Longer term, before I forget, obviously market looking pretty good. Shorter term, yes, shorter term, you are right. And I think it was Jim, Freeman, I think, was talking about the, the hourly bow tie. You're right, it is. The only problem is, well, I guess you had a clean trigger. Well, you didn't really have a clean trigger, okay? All right, here's, here's the thing, not to split hairs, but let's take a look at this hourly bow tie real quick. So, yes, you did have an hourly bow tie, but let's look at the official signal. So, I mean, technically, you could say, well, we had an hourly first thrust down. You go short right there, and then bam, you catch a nice move overnight. But the actual bow tie itself did not do a full crossing until, okay, those two moving averages, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, are equal, the 20 to 30. So it wasn't until the third that we actually had the official signal. It depends on how liberal your trigger is. It may have not triggered yet. And then now the moving average is coming back together. So that I kind of see that as more of a shot across the bow versus a bona fide bow tie on an hourly basis. Okay. But yes, it is there and we have to pay attention. And then you can see the moving averages are beginning to come together a little bit, but the momentum I think is there. And let's not get too excited just yet. But no, I really appreciate the, the work you guys are doing on the market timing in the Facebook group. Keep it up, because that's something that you gotta look at every day. And you know, that's another thing I got from the group is that I tend to have a little bit of an opinion and with my agreeableness, I'm not quick to change that opinion. But you guys, or actually I think it was a girl, pointed out that my TFM system had triggered a signal. And I, I wasn't ready to get bullish just yet, and lo and behold, it did. So. Extra pair of eyes really helps in this business. NASDAQ composite, a little bit of gap open today, coming back in. So far, it looks pretty darn good. Let me clean this chart up a little bit. So I think we're, I think we're still in pretty good shape overall. And we've had this really nice persistent move higher, a little bit of correction. So far, so good. I'd actually like a little bit more pullback, some more fake out here and there so I could get some setups and then get long. Enough to scare a few people out, but not everyone. They're rusty, ah, this rusty thing. It's having a hard time getting going. Broke out about a week or so ago, and then came right back in. One of the problems with a market when it's breaking out, if it doesn't break out decisively, one or two big days can put it right back into its trading range. Energies, wide and loose and all over the place. Stay away from those guys. Gold has been waking up, the gold stocks at least. Gold the commodity, not so much, but gold the stocks. Look at this. 
banging out new multi-month highs, pull back recently, or not so recently, I should say, at, at the uh, beginning of September. But so far, so good. Not too far from brand new highs. Let's take a look at gold to commodity. Not quite as good, but it is pushing back into this overhead supply. I wouldn't rush out and buy a gold to commodity, but I do like the way the gold stocks look. And keep in mind that if gold does improve a little bit in here, those stocks are going to do really well because those stocks are leveraged. Let's say the cost to mine gold is whatever, $1,000 an ounce and gold goes up $100. Well, that profitability of that company just went up 10%, which is huge. Or as our Twitter in chief says, huge. Drugs, kind of Flatsville, but you can see recently banging out new highs just yesterday. Nice little breakout remains intact there. Health services kind of looks pretty much the same, looking pretty good in here so far. Transports, eh, they came back in and they're looking a little dubious at this juncture. You know, routine, they'll take things one day at a time. Semis broke down out of this little consolidation, but wasn't quite the end of the world. And then one day later, pop back higher and then working their way a little bit higher today. So, so far, so good there. So overall, without going through each and every one of them, Sector are actually looking pretty good. Bonds, I think bonds are still in the questionable column. You had a thrust down, a deep pullback, a thrust down, a deep, or not a deep pullback, but a pullback. And now you're getting another pullback in here. So I guess the, without sounding like I'm counting a wave or something, for the most part, you're getting mostly lower lows and lower highs, although I think we did have a little bit of a peak here. So as long as it keeps doing that, I think it's still in trouble. If you back the chart way out, it still looks like a top remains a place there. But again, you know what I'm seeing one day at a time. Let's take a look at the dollar real quick. Dollar still looks a little toppy in here. It did retrace back up a little bit, but stalled short of its prior high. So, so far, I still think a top remains a place in the dollar. Hey, Dave, your general thoughts on the recent first thrust V-shaped pullback in BRSK. Okay, let's take a look at some setups. Okay. Too many days in the pullback? Yeah, it, for a short, it's a few too many days in the pullback, okay? Now, it, it does have a low HV, but that's okay when you're looking to short something. I'm okay with a lower HV, especially if the stock has a lot of volume like this one. Now, let me interview myself. Does this look like a major top? Yes. Would I take the trade? No. Too many days in the pullback. Now, keep in mind, I'll, I'll look at these things on a case-by-case -case basis, but the reason I don't like this one, or in general, a lot of days in the pullback on the short side is because if a short triggers right away after a day or two, then it catches the most amount of people off guard. Okay, so yeah, to answer your question, which you did yourself, too many days. Of course, the PB did magically stop at the 50-day MA. Yeah, we used to have a, have a guy in here that was a huge fan of the 50, and nothing wrong with that. Uh, magically, it does seem a little magical. I think I think you got to be careful, though. I think we as humans, and I've actually read about this quite a bit. It's why you look at a cloud and hey, the cloud looks like you know whatever. Uh, looks like the Twitter in chief. It's huge. But a lot of times it does seem like that mar the markets go up, tag that 50, and then roll back over and vice versa on the upside. Don't know if that's a self-fulfilling prophecy or not, but you got to kind of be careful with it because look, it tagged it here and then what happened? Then it rolled over, right? So I don't think it would test out, but I think it is kind of a, an interesting anomaly. Okay. Any more stocks? Anything you want to look at? Oh, you're welcome, Chris. Anytime, buddy. Chris puts a lot of good analysis out in the Facebook group. Thank you for that. We actually got two or three Chris's in there, and they're all pretty smart, except for that one Chris. No, I'm just I'm kidding. All right, any any last questions? Going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, DaveLandry.com slash contact. Everybody have a great weekend. We don't speak between now and then. Thank you so much.